request prayer. You wouldn't request request prayer if she didn't have faith that you'd pray and faith that God can answer. Keep that in your mind. Keep that in your heart. Keep that in your prayer. Thank God we serve a God that can answer prayer and will answer prayer. If you make heaven your home, if you make heaven your home, you will do it by the way of the cross or you'll not do it at all. It's just that simple. That's what the Bible says. One sacrifice for sin, Jesus Christ and him alone. You come to him, you get born again by the grace of God. You can talk to him. You can pray to him and he'll move and work in your life. But the first step is you must be born again. Take your Bibles and turn this morning to the book of Acts, chapter number 11. Acts, chapter number 11. Talk about something. This week, matter of fact, this morning and tonight and Wednesday night. It's an important question for you and I. Look at Acts chapter 11, verse number 25. The Bible says, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. So there is a revival going on. People are being saved. And Barnabas, he's just in over his head. So he goes to get some help. It's a smart man. It's a man with wisdom. Verse 26 says, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. We're going to talk this week, Lord willing, on the topic of how to live a Christian life. Brother Peel, would you mind praying for us, brother? Thank you, Lord. Many people want to live a Christian life. It's a life of joy. It's a life of peace. It's a life of comfort in God. That's what the Christian life is. Are there trials? Absolutely. Are there tribulations? Absolutely. But that does not distract from the peace and the joy that can only be found in Jesus Christ. And people see it in Christians. In those that have been born again by the grace of God, people see it and people see that and they want it. They want that life of peace. They want that that life of joy that this world does not and cannot offer. Christian, the word Christian means Christ-like or like Christ. Same attributes, same characteristics. Of course, he was God. All his attributes, his characteristics were perfect. 
and mine and yours will not be, but we can have that divine nature. The Bible says we are partakers of the divine nature. Love, joy, peace, forgiveness, righteousness, not compromising. We can have those same characteristics in our life, and if you are born again by the grace of God, they should be there. They should be there in our life. Now these men, Barnabas and Paul, they came to Antioch. They found these people saved and wanting to live for God. And so they did all they knew to do. They began to open up the scriptures that they had and preach Jesus Christ and preach and teach them what God said. And it affected these people in such a way that people began to call them Christians, Christ-like first, right here. They didn't call them that in Jerusalem. They didn't call them that in Judea. They were called Christians first here in Antioch. Amen. These people, the way we like to put it is, they got a hold of something. If you were born again by the grace of God, you got a hold of something one day that changed your life. It changed your heart. It changed your demeanor. You think I'm mean now? You should have known me then. Christian, Christ-like. It is the best life to live. But if we don't understand what God says about the Christian life, we will stumble and come short of the life God would have us to live. He has things prepared for you and I. He has instructions laid down in his book and he wants to bless our life, but we're going to have to line up with him. This world expects God to line up with them and it doesn't work that way. You and I must line up with God's word. We don't know what he says will come short. I've said this before. Many people are pecking with the chickens when God will have them soaring with the eagles. That's the kind of life God has prepared for you to live as a Christian. You see a flock of chickens and you see chickens pecking on the ground, you don't think much about it, do you? They're chickens, that's what God made them to do. But if you look out in your yard and you see an eagle pecking with the chickens, Like Moses when he saw the burning bush. I will step aside and see this. <laughs> Just isn't right, is it? God didn't make an eagle to live like that. He made an eagle to soar and be majestic. This week we're going to talk about how to live a Christian life. We're going to talk about one point this morning, and it's the first point. If you're going to live a Christian life, you must be born again. Amen. You say, well, preacher, everybody knows that. Don't you believe that? Don't you fall for that lie. Many people in this world don't understand being born again. They don't understand what it is to be born again, to be saved, but many people see that joy in Christian's life and they go out and they get religion and they get a church and they get some good works in their life and they try to, through their strength, manifest those attributes of Christ in their life, but they try to do it without Christ and it cannot be done. Wonder why people are in and out why churches flare up and die down? Why people struggle so bad? Because many of them have never been born again. I've heard people say, well, I can't live the Christian life. You are absolutely right. You cannot in your own strength and power live a Christian life. But if you will trust Jesus Christ for your soul salvation, the Holy Spirit of God comes to indwell and He, He, he can live a Christian life through you and in spite of you. Amen. You say, in spite of me? 
How many times have we said the wrong thing and done the wrong thing and got on the wrong track, but God in his mercy and his love and his grace bring us back? How many times? You say, well, I ain't never stumbled like that. You just hang on. You've probably been saved about 45 seconds if you ain't thought the wrong thing or done the wrong thing. You must be born again. Many people want that good deal. Many people want what Christ has to offer, but they will not surrender their heart and their mind and their will to Christ that they may be born again. They want that good deal. It looks good and it looks prosperous. God is not a deal maker. Amen. God is not the man upstairs that we will talk to and we'll work out a compromise. God is God. Amen. He always has been God. He always will be God. Before this earth was, he was God. After this earth is gone and renovated, he will be God. Well, why? Why must we be born again? It's a valid question. Why must we, all people, be born again? We've been studying through the book of Genesis on Wednesday night, and it's a blessing. Amen. You haven't been coming, you need to make it on out if you can, or check in online, it has been a blessing. God created man. He did not create a speck or a tadpole or a monkey and it turned into a man. That is evolution. That is a lie from the devil. God created man. And he wasn't like you and I, this Adam. God created him perfect. Some of you said, well, I got Richie. <laughs> I understand that, but... Thank God for a good husband and a good wife. God created this man and this woman, and they were perfect, sinless, never had sin, never said a cross word, never thought a bad thought, perfect. And he took this man and woman, and he placed them in the perfect environment. No smog, wasn't too hot, wasn't too cold, Everything man needed just grew and was right there at his fingertips. And this perfect man and this perfect environment had perfect fellowship with God. God came down in the cool of the evening and walked and talked with these people. We see that through Genesis 2. And Genesis 3 comes. And within 10 verses, we see this perfect man, perfect woman, perfect environment, perfect fellowship. We see them naked. We see them guilty. We see them ashamed. We see them afraid and hiding from the God that they once walked in close fellowship with. What happened? Sin happened. Sin entered into the world Death by sin and this perfect people, this perfect environment is all of a sudden plunged into chaos because man sinned. Can you imagine how Adam and Eve looked forward to God coming down every day and walking and talking with them? We've been in those services when it's just so good you don't want it to end. Can you imagine every day God coming down and talking to you and all of a sudden something's wrong. That's why we must be born again. That sin was passed down from Adam to all mankind. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. 
our iniquities have separated between us and our God and if we're going to make heaven our home with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and our God, we must be born again. That's why. Well, what does being born again mean? I've heard that. You even hear the old redneck preacher say, you must be born again. We know what that means. But what does it mean? Turn to John chapter 3 with me. John chapter number 3, the gospel according to John chapter number 3, and we'll see what Jesus told this religious leader about it. So here's Nicodemus. He is a religious man. He's a leader of the Jews, a religious leader of God's people. Not some heathen in the jungle. This is God's people. Had God's laws, the oracles, were told how to worship and told how to live and told how to behave. And here's this man, Nicodemus. He comes to Jesus by night. He begins to talk to Jesus and ask Jesus questions. And he's trying to throw Jesus off the track. Jesus is going to tell him about being born again. He wants to talk about what he knows and these things and miracles and this and that. Look what Jesus tells him. John chapter 3, verse number 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he will not make it. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That capital S is the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 6. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That's the water birth. The water birth. A baby inside the mother is in the form of water, which is how God designed us. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not, I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Jesus compared that natural birth and our rebirth. He compared the water birth and the spiritual birth. We all sitting here today have that first birth, the water birth. We all sitting here today have that old nature, that nature handed down, that sin nature from our father's father's father, Adam. It came down to all. Say, well, my little baby, your little baby is going to bite somebody first chance they get. That's just what they're going to do. It's the only weapon they have. Little old fingernails are still flexible. When they're little, they can't even hardly scratch nobody. Them teeth hard, buddy. They get one tooth in that head, and they are going to use it as a dangerous weapon. Why? That's all they know to do. It's our nature handed down to all people. We have all received that water birth, that natural birth, but we have not all received that spiritual birth. That spiritual birth comes down from God. It is an operation of God. The Bible says Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the sin debt of the world. And if any man will believe on him that he died according to the scriptures, was buried and was raised again the third day according to the scriptures to pay our sin debt, if any man will believe that, the Bible says the Spirit of God will come and dwell him and seal him and that person will be born again of the Spirit. Amen. That's what being born again means. It is a spiritual birth. You cannot get it by getting on a church roll. Amen. That's not spiritual. You cannot get it by getting in the baptism. That's not spiritual, that's physical. You cannot get it by your good works. Thank God for good works, they are physical. Spiritual birth comes from above through the operation of God. You place your faith in Jesus Christ, he saves your soul. That's why if you're going to live a Christian life and be Christ-like, you must have Christ. Amen. Romans chapter 8, verse number 9 says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none 
of his. Amen. Now Saul of Tarsus, we know who Saul is. He got saved, he got born again. He became Paul. It was his Greek name. Saul was his Jewish name. And his conversion, being born again, is a pattern. We read it this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul said he was saved, the chiefest of the sinners, born again. He was a blasphemer. He was injurious. He got saved as a pattern to those that will come after. Now, a pattern is something you work by. It's not the exact same thing. Moses was told by God to build the tabernacle after the pattern of things he was showed in the heaven. Was that tabernacle heaven on earth? It sure won't. They was killing animals and burning them, but it was a pattern of the things in heaven. I can remember my grandmother when I was a child. She had a drawer, and she kept patterns in it. And it was pattern for dresses and shirts. And you get your pattern out, and you fold out on your cloth, and you pin it. And you cut along those lines according to your size and you get it out and you show it and you sew it up and you have a dress. No two dresses are identical. If you could check them and measure them, there's no way they'd be identical. But they were made off that pattern. Now Paul said his salvation was a pattern to you and I. Turn to Acts chapter 9 with me. Flip over a couple of pages. Let's look at these things at Acts chapter 9. Let's look at these things in Paul's conversion that must, I say must, be in someone's conversion for it to be biblical salvation. There's a whole bunch of salvation floating around in this old world. If you listen to people, different ways and come as you are and come this and this and that. I'm talking about biblical salvation that sticks as last. If you've been born again by the grace of God, you cannot be lost again. It's called eternal security. But this thing we have going on today, this altar grace, this come any way you want, and you wonder why people flipping in and out and here and there, biblical salvation is precious. Biblical salvation is of God. It's not something to be thrown away like an old shirt when it's out of style. This biblical salvation we're going to see in Paul the Apostle's life was a pattern. Does that mean we'll all be like Paul? There was only one Paul. There was only one Brother Brooks. Somebody said amen. There's only one missing Ned. We could probably deal with a couple more. Her, I don't know about Brother John. One of his probably a plenty. We're not all going to be the same. But this pattern must be in our salvation experience. Look at Acts chapter number 9, verse number 3. So here's Paul. He's going about his business. He's going to kill some more Christians. But he meets a man. And the man's Jesus Christ. I thank God today I met Jesus Christ. Amen. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse number 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a verse saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Paul didn't set out that day to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. We set out of our house this morning. We should have with the intention of coming down here and corporately as a group meeting the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He didn't set out for that. He set out with an evil purpose. Many people have set out to church and their intention was not to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. Other reasons. 
feeling guilty, feeling bad, in trouble. There's a girl down there I like. There's a boy down there I like. Set out. Their attention was not to meet Jesus Christ, but Jesus found them. Amen. So here we have Paul. He set out. He saw at this time. He set out. And he met Jesus Christ on the way. And it affected this man. After this man met Jesus Christ, he was never the same. You know, it's hard to find a lost person. If you ask them, everybody say, and I've prayed a prayer and been to an altar, but when they get up, Nothing's changed. That's not biblical salvation. Look at verse number 6. The Bible says, And he being Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will thou, thou have me to do? Biblical salvation always involves these two elements. Fear and and recognition of who God is. Before you got saved, before you got under that conviction that the Bible says you must have of the Holy Spirit to be saved, you did not know who God was. You did not have a true picture of who God was. You may have been to church. You may have sat in the Sunday school. You may have taken part in the religious things, but you in your heart did not have a true picture of who God was, and you did not fear him of good godly biblical fear. You know, I was praying over this message and working on it, and we went Thursday night and heard Brother Tim Ellis preach. And he was preaching a good message, and it was just like, in the middle of this thing, he threw something out. He said, I'm a firm believer from my study in the scriptures that if someone is going to be truly, biblically saved, born again, some things must happen in their life. They must have the conviction of God in their life. And he said, somehow, some way, God always brings a godly fear into their lives before they're saved. And he went on with his message. I thought, that dude probably didn't know what he said. He thought he was making a good point. That thing didn't even go with his message. That was for me, I believe. In this message, if you are going to be born again by the grace of God, you have to have some godly fear in your life. Realize who God is, that there is a hell and it's real and the devil's not going to push you there. He doesn't have the authority. The one that has the authority to put someone in hell was God. Fear not him that can kill the body and then do nothing else. Fear him that can destroy both body and soul with hell. That is God. Amen. Philippian jailer. We know about him, don't we? The Bible says in Acts chapter 16, he came in before Paul and Silas and threw himself down. And the Bible says he trembled. You know what that is? It's a fear of God. I can remember in my own looking back now. I didn't know it then. When I got saved, it was the first time in my life. I've been under conviction. But it was the first time in my life that hell became real to me. I was laying in that bed reading that Bible and it was as real as if I was there. That hell was real and that's where I was going and there was nothing I could do about it. That's when a man or woman gets at the end of their rope when they realize that there's nothing they themselves can do about it. That Jesus Christ is the only way to escape the damnation of hell. Fear. You've heard our pastor's testimony. He came in to preach to a church, this church. By his own admission, he was not looking for Jesus. And that man preached about the great white throne judgment and the people standing before that great white throne and being cast into the lake of fire. And he said, 
for the first time in his life, he realized all that was real. And he asked the Lord to save his soul. Biblical salvation always involves fear, and it always involves astonishment. You must see God for who he is and see yourself for who you are. That's what's missing today. God's not preached as holy. He's not preached as righteous. He's not preached as the one with all power and all authority. He's the man upstairs. He's the man that loves everybody so much he wouldn't condemn anybody to hell. And we're all good if we measure ourselves amongst ourselves. Everybody's got a little bit of good in them. You must see yourself for who you really are and see God for who he really is. He is holy. He's pure. He's light. In him is no darkness at all. He has never done wrong. He has never changed. He always has been. He always will be. He's never sinned. He's never thought the wrong thought. He's never done the wrong deed. He's holy. He's God. And you and I are sinful men. Peter was in the boat fishing. Jesus helped him out with his fishing. And somehow, that brought some fear and astonishment to Peter's life. Peter didn't jump up and shout. He didn't run a lap. He didn't do that, did he? Peter fell down at his feet. And he said, Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. He said, you don't need to be around me, Lord. I'm a sinful man, and you are holy and pure. Depart from me, Lord. You know what that is? That's somebody realizing who God is, and that's somebody realizing who they are that had fear in their life. Saul, the man who brought fear and astonishment to others was converted. Born again when he met the Savior. Say, well, I'm a pretty good girl. I'm a pretty good guy. Try not to do wrong things. Paul, by his own testimony, he was the most one that did. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Come on, a bunch of heretics. Concerning the law said he was blameless. But when he met the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what he said about all his qualifications? He said, I count them but as dung. He said, all those things that I had in my own righteousness, I count them as dung compared to receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. been born again was there a time in your life when you realized who God was and who you were and fear came upon you and in you because you realized you deserve that hell that's as real as this place we're sitting in this morning have you ever been born again the Bible says there is a river the streams whereof make glad the city of God. Has there ever been a time in your life when the grace of God came in and flushed your heart of all the sin and filth and nastiness? Has there ever been a time in your life when the streams which flow from the hands and feet and pierced side of Jesus Christ came into your heart and flooded your heart till it overfilled the banks and it came down as tears of joy and happiness and thankfulness upon your cheeks. Has there ever been a time in your life when you met Jesus Christ and you were changed? That's biblical salvation. Will we all be the same? Absolutely not. But we're all going to have some of those same characteristics, aren't we? It's called being Christ-like. Now, I'm issue a word of warning here. You must come while the Spirit of God 
deal with your heart. Conviction is necessary for salvation. This gospel has preached now in many places has gotten so watered down and it's come any time you want, any way you want and the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll just be glad to meet you on your own terms. It's not biblical. If the Lord Jesus Christ has spoke to you this morning and the Holy Spirit of God's touched your heart, you better not wait till the altar call. Do not let this day pass you by. Salvation is more than believing with the mind the facts of the gospel. It's believing with the heart, the Bible says, to the surrender of the mind and the heart and the will to the Lord Jesus Christ. For with the mouth, confession is made in salvation. With the heart, the very next verse, Romans 10 and 10 says, if you believe in your heart, heart that God raised him from the dead you shall be saved it's more than the mind the mind computes facts the mind knows that two plus two is four your will decided what you had for breakfast this morning the mind can understand that Jesus Christ hung on a cross and he shed his blood and he gave his life and he raised, he's alive forevermore. The mind can understand that, but if it's never got into your heart and you surrender your will and you still live in your life according to what you want it to be, that's not biblical salvation. Amen. I was raised in North Carolina. Thank God for it. And we went to church. My parents didn't, and they sure made sure I got there. The van didn't get me. I had to walk. I didn't mind it, though. I like going to church. I knew some things about Jesus. In my mind, you would never have talked me down off the fact that Jesus Christ is real. You couldn't have, even as a child, you as an adult couldn't have talked me down off that. But it never got into my heart. I never surrendered my will. It's still my will and my way. And I met my wife. I remember we went on a trip one day and we come back and we just about had a fist fight over the fact that I was saved because I believed in Jesus Christ. And she said, well, you kind of ain't living like it. You know what I was? I believed all about Jesus in my head. But I was lost. I had never met the Savior with fear and astonishment. I didn't see him for who he truly was. I didn't see me for who I truly was. I was a good old boy. I was lost. If I died before September 19th, 2004, knowing the facts that I knew about Jesus Christ, if I died before September 19th, 2004, no doubt I would have went to a devil's hell. But the Holy Spirit dealt with my heart. And I surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. He saved my soul. If you are born again here this morning, the exact same thing happened to you. The places may be different. The circumstance may be different. But there was astonishment. You saw him. You saw yourself. There was fear of that hell and eternal punishment coming. And you asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save your soul. That will be the same for everyone. And if you never had that in your life, you are not saved. Amen. That's a tough pill to swallow. You used to go to any church around here 75 years ago and hear that. You don't hear it much now. People don't want to offend. They don't care if God's offended. You know, John Calvin was wrong. You can resist the Holy Spirit. Paul stood before Felix and he preached. And the Bible says Felix trembled. You know what that is? That's the fear of God. You know what Felix did? Same verse said he sent him away. Sent him away. 
people sit in a pew and God deals with their heart and they're trembling and they know that hell's real and they know they deserve that hell. They know what's going to happen. They'll tremble and they'll tremble before God and tremble before a holy God and realize who he is and yet they'll put it off and they'll push him away. And many times the reason is, is well, I'll do it later. You are not guaranteed another chance. You, as you sit here this morning, are not guaranteed another hour on this earth. God is real. The gospel is real. Heaven's real. Hell is real. And if God's dealt with your heart, you better not let this opportunity pass you by because you are not guaranteed another chance. You can't do it any old time you want. You can't wait until your deathbed and then I'll give my heart to the Lord. He may not deal with your heart at that time. People have gotten up and walked out of a church under conviction with the good intention of I'll do it later. And God never touched their heart again. And they live out their life and die and go to the devil's hell. Say, God would do that. God loves you. And God gave his only son to give his life for you. And when he touches your heart, he'll save your soul if you come to him. And he'll not force you into heaven. If you want hell, you can have it. But if God touches your heart and you want heaven, you come to this altar, Jesus will receive you unto itself that you might be saved. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, listen, which were not, which were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And people say, well, amen, that man, he can't get you in, the preacher can't preach you in. You can't get yourself in either if God's not drawing you. Amen. And if he is, you Better not turn him away. Don't turn God away. Mays Jackson, old time preacher. He used to preach a sermon. And it was called, Sending Away Your Day of Grace. God will not be put in your box. That's what people think. Under conviction, God dealing with the heart, know they need to be saved, and I'll wait till later. I'll put them in this box, and I'll shed it, set them on my shelf, and when it's a more convenient season for me, I'll get him down, and I'll allow him to save my soul. I got this going on now, and I have this relationship I have to take care of, I just started this thing I'm doing. It's not exactly godly, but I really enjoy it. And, and I'm afraid if I give my heart to Jesus, I'll have to put it down. I really enjoy it. I've got this business opportunity that's going to interfere. So I'll just put them up here. And in a more convenient season, is what the man said in the book of Acts, I'll get him out and I'll allow him the privilege of saving my soul. It will not work. God is not a child's toy to be put up and pulled back out when it's time to play with him. God's not your pet sitting around waiting on someone to whistle and snap their fingers where he can come to them. God is God. The heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Can your box? But I got some good news. I got some good news. The Bible says if you seek him, he will be found. If you seek God with a true heart, he will convict your soul. If you seek God with a true heart, seek and you shall find. That's what the Bible says. Time. And time and time again, 
Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. That means that he can be found. But you better seek him now. If you seek God with true heart, he will convict you. He will bring that fear into your life. He will bring astonishment. And if you come to him with that true heart, he will receive you that you may be born again. That's the best news mankind ever heard that there is a God who gave his life for them that they might be saved. I'll do it later. You might not have a later. It's not a good deal you need to seek. It's not someone you need to seek that will fix your finances. Who fix your finances? Absolutely. I'm having trouble in marriage, so I think I'll get saved, and God will fix your marriage. But if you're seeking him to fix your marriage, it ain't going to work. Well, I'm in some trouble. I got this bad trouble going on, so I think I'll get saved. You know what? If God's leading on your heart, he'll save your soul. But if you're seeking a Band-Aid to fix your trouble, it ain't going to work. But if you will seek God, the true and the living God, the holy God, with a true heart, Lord, show me. Lord, show me that you're real. Lord, show me what I am. Lord, help. I've heard it and I want to believe it. I need your help, Lord. The Bible says he will respond. If you come to him with a true heart, he will save your soul. That's the first step. Finances will come. Family will come, troubles will come, but the first step, the Bible says, is you must be born again. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you need to come pray this morning. God knows.